Hey, what's up? Welcome back to the Neglect Fanny Podcast. I'm your host, Zuhoya. And if you have not yet done so, hit that subscribe and follow button so you won't miss another podcast episode. What's good? Welcome back to another episode. (laughs) Man, this is episode 7. Crazy, crazy. I'm just trying to keep up with these uploads and... Honestly, like, it's going good so far. And, damn, I gotta stop saying N, N, N. Like, what the? Anyways, I always catch myself saying N. I'm gonna try my hardest not to say N. Anyways, but, yeah, today is, I have Kyle Somuskuku on. We'll be talking about him and how he's become a Hopi endurance runner. He just recently... Finished a marathon back in October, the 125th Boston Marathon. And before that, he ran in the Shiprock Marathon, which qualified him to run in the Boston Marathon. He ran the Shiprock Marathon in two hours, I believe. And I don't know the minutes, but I know it was in two hours which qualified him to run in the Boston Marathon. This was Kyle's first Boston trip, and he also had the opportunity to run with credible runners on this international stage, because I believe that the Boston Marathon is one of the biggest stages to compete in. He just recently finished 48th, out of 18,000 runners at the Boston Marathon race. He closed out his first Boston Marathon with a finish setting a new personal best and personal record for the endurance race with an official time hours, 26 minutes and 17 seconds. He placed 48th overall out of 18,000 participants, averaging five minutes and 35 minutes Per mile. We have Kyle on today to talk about his experience and his journey as a runner. So let's get into this episode. All right. Yo, what's up, everybody? Okay. Welcome back to the, the Nukwats Fanny Skateboarding Podcast. Um, I have Kyle Sumetskuku here. He's um, a Hopi runner and athlete. So, yeah, man. What's up, Kyle? How you been? How's life? All in all, it's been doing. Uh, all in all, it's been good. You know, it's it's been uh, it's been a while. You know, ever since with the whole podcast realm, so it's good to be back. And you know, and all in all, I just want to say thank you and uh, giving me the special privilege, and it's an honor to be here. So thank you, man. Yeah, man, you're welcome, dude. It's, um, I always um followed your running journey and all that stuff too, and it's, um. Pretty honored to have you on the podcast too. So it's been good, all in all, good. Just uh, starting to train, as I was saying, and uh, yeah, the next big marathon is in uh, Honolulu Marathon in Hawaii come December. So you know, I got fall, uh, no summer, fall, and then a little bit of winter. So I'm excited. Oh, oh wow! In December? Yeah, in Hawaii, man. <laughs> Oh, well, you should, it should be good out there then. The weather should be nice. Yeah, totally. I'm mm-hmm. um, looking forward to it. I've never been to Hawaii during that time of the month, but, you know, it's something to look forward to and something new because I've never been to Hawaii. So, yeah, it's been good. Yeah, dude, it's a first for everything. That's awesome, man. What got you into running? At what age did you start running? I started when, well, it all started from when I was a little boy uh, back at the Mocha Bay School. Uh, I first tried out for the sport, I think it was in kin, not kindergarten or first grade. But um, yeah, I remember the day that my parents were just made me join a sport because like my dad's sister was the coach and then there was a really close relative that was close to us in that family. So, you know, they made me try out the sport and then... Uh, I didn't really take running too seriously because, you know, I didn't, I did not know the whole art of the sport. But then again, 
you know, I just did it for fun because, you know, the Mokabi Day School had a big recess compound and, you know, we literally had like a cross country invite there and had like a big race, uh, recess compound at the Mokabi Day School. So it was kind of ridiculous that uh, we had like our own cross country course there and especially invite. So, you know, it was just all about living those um, youthful years when I was a little kid. So, you know, it just kind of grown, grown upon me with, you know, being active, but, you know, as times went on from first, second, third, fourth, or fifth grade, you know, I became to mature and started to notice that um, I'm getting older and the fitness wise, I'm starting to learn about more of the art of running, the competition and why it's so important to do like these little, these little things with exercises such as warming up, cooling down, you know, all those little things just become a, just to become a good runner. But in the past, it was just like, you know, just, all right, let's go off on run, you know, but it all started from the Mokopi day school. And then it kind of prologued into going into junior high, then high school and then collegiate. And then, yeah, man. Dang. So you just been running your whole life then, huh? <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much, man. You know, I, I mean, I think that's all that <clears throat> I pretty much wanted to do on Hopi uh, because, you know, living on the Hopi reservation, you know, that's how everything kind of relied on is sports, you know, cross country, basketball, softball, baseball, football. And yeah, man, the, I was just one of those, like, those ordinary kids just to go out for a sport and see where, where, it can unfold or how it can unfold from there. Yeah. You didn't try any other sports like basketball or anything in that realm, like baseball. Uh, yeah, I did try basketball. You know, I, I, like I said, I was just too short, you know, I couldn't really properly dribble a ball or shoot a basket. You know, I always played pickleball, which was okay, but uh, the sport itself, I never took too seriously. And then it went to softball because, you know, I just wanted to try another sport and then football, uh, that wasn't introduced to me till like around junior high. Uh, wasn't too interested in that or soccer or baseball or just any other sport. It was just cross country and track and field for me. That was it, man. Yeah, because I ran um, cross country in um, high school. Um it was something that my dad wanted me to do. So I was like, I'll try it. I'll give it a shot. And I tried, like I said, like, I tried the other sports as well, like basketball, football. I mean, basketball was like my go-to from Munkopi Day School all the way up to um, high school. And I tried softball, but I mean, not softball, baseball. And that wasn't really for me. It wasn't like really intriguing or nothing like that. But and then eighth grade, I tried football, and <laughs> my dad went all out for me and my brother to join the team and everything like that. And they put me as a running back because I was, like, small. And I wasn't, like, I was, like, built to be a running back, I guess. I don't know why they put me in a running back. But that first practice, they did, like, the scrimmage and everything. They handed me the ball, and, man, I got tackled real hard and after that I was like yep this is not for me <laughs> so after I got hit pretty good I was like yeah football is not my thing and that's when I just started um trying to figure out what I wanted to do it kind of reminds me where like in a movie where like there's this kid who always wants to try out a new sport and then next you know like they first get handed the ball and then next you know they just get pummeled and sacked and be like and they lay on the Lay on the field and be like, oh, geez, yeah, this sport is not really made for me. Like, <laughs> you found your, your passion for running, like, um, in Hopi because, like, Hopi, or running is a big part of Hopi culture, which is, as a Hopi runner, what does it mean to you? Uh, you know, like you said, as in, like, you're pretty much, like, correct on that as, you know, being a Hopi runner, it dates back as when we had no auto no, uh, automobiles, we had no wagons, we did rely on horses and horseback riding and mules. But then again, like, I think looking back, knowing that learning, learning my, our history is that uh, we kind of just pretty much survived on, 
survived on our feet, you know, being uh, farmers. Um, you know, I love the great tale or when the old men, like the old men used to tell that story where, um, where Hopi, run, Hopi farmers that were runners, they used to like run from Arrivi to Monkapi just to, you know, just to take care of their fields by sundown, they go back. And that really intrigued me. And I was like, man, why? I, was like, I never knew that how they used to transport themselves just to go to the fields or go to water, go get water or go send a message or, you know, all those uh, kind of like those important tasks and things. But then again, on the side of it, it was the spiritual aspect to it, knowing that, you know, I guess, you know, every village has a runner where they want them to take some prayer feathers to this sacred shrine that's like about possibly seven to eight miles out and then coming back and then finishing that segment there knowing that hey i the runner has done this task with them and the hopi men are so glad and then you know from that time on evolving i guess you know it kind of opened my eyes much more knowing that it does tie in with the beginning of time when we lived off our feet and then we did it just for the spiritual aspect but as time went on you know that's when i kind of in wake myself when I heard the story about the Hopi Olympian, uh, Louis Tuanama, Philip Zioma, Franklin Sahu, Harry Chaka. And, you know, that kind of like just blew my mind where like, wow, like literally the Hopi reservation is the heart of running. And it kind of evolved when Louis Tuanama went to Stockholm, Sweden, just to um, compete in the, uh, in the 10K and he got a silver medal and then Philip Zioma did the same thing and then Harry Chakta and then it kind of evolved from the 10K to the marathon and then knowing that it made that spectrum where like hoping runners made just just this big picture of knowing that running is in our DNA. We lived off of running and till this day, like, you know, if there is a good runner from Hopi, they're going to guide them they're going to guide them into the right directions by the dads or the uncles or, you know, the elders basically in the village, knowing that they want him to go on a good journey and they want him to be on the right path. And they want him to live a long, long, fruitful life, knowing that he's not running for, I'm not running for myself, you know, but it's running for the people and making sure that the people are living, want to live a long, a long life. And, you know, that whole realm of being a Hopi runner, there's always that aspect of learning from the spiritual aspect is learning and, you know, just being self-respect to yourself, being respectful to the elders and being respectful to your peers and being respectful to the land and, you know, just living that art, that Hopi art of, you know, like, this is why we do this because we're just farmers. We live off the land. We're humble about it. If it's that backbreaking and the hard labor is that harsh, then the whole outcome is going to be much more greater knowing that you're feeding your people, you're giving your people strength and you're basically living through the harsh lives of endurance, such as, you know, working out in the fields or, taking some water or you know just all those certain things because we are humble we are uh persistent we are um have that endurance because back then you know we kind of hope we has chose that that enduring life where there's going to be struggles but then again on the bright side you worked hard for it you're going to get some some good results and have something so abundant knowing that it would take care of your people and lastly in yourself so you know it's all about humility humbleness respect and you know just creating those good relationships who help you along the way and believe me there's so much that I can talk so much about what it's to be a Hopi runner but then again I'm just I'm just a guy from the Hopi reservation so yeah yeah man I mean also, it connects to your ancestors too, like because like we're we're runners. Well, my, well, yeah, Hopi is we're all runners, but 
yet we um we're all chubby and little tiny hopies <laughs> because like he said back then we didn't have any cars or nothing and what the only way our tra- transportation was like running and they would run to like different villages and far out even to like wherever they need to send a message to like they would send the best hopi runners to go deliver a message and that would be like three four hundred miles out and that's cool that you're following in their footsteps and continuing their running hoping running you know it kind of creates that catalyst where you want to share with the next generation or even the youth or the younger ones you know because you know like Hopi is generational, generation to generation sharing, knowing that we want to keep this alive. We want to keep this, this whole catalyst alive, knowing that, you know, we, we love our way of life. We love what we, who we are and where we come from. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, dude. And who is your running support network? Like who's behind you on your whole running journey? So right now, um, uh, first and foremost, I want to say like my parents, like my mom and dad, I mean, they always have been there. They always have been the ground support main uh, system from, especially from home and especially growing up and like go- running throughout my uh, running year, like running years from like the Mokabi Day School through the Tibi City Boarding School and then high school. So I, w- I just want to put them first because well, they kind of like crack me into a runner that I am supposed to be. And it all starts from home. But on the side of that, but the main system is that uh, I have a team. It's called uh, Team Lead Dial. And we have about six to possibly another member of probably seven to eight members of Team Lead Dial. And Lead Dial means running fox in Hopi. So that is my Hopi name when I got initiated when I went into the Kachina Society. So my godparents are Coyote Clan. So, but um, yeah, um, Team Latile, um, they kind of pretty much, they are my backbone to whenever, they accommodate me with uh, needs such as travel, uh, nutrition wise, you know, but it's always good. I'm pretty much made focus on a whole team effort, knowing that I trust my teammates. I trust the the relationship and the chemistry between myself running and then them them accommodating me. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, your team, like, who does your team consist of? Like, who's all on your team? So, all right. So, team-wise, we have our captain uh Dwayne Humiestua, our co-captain uh Gene Humiestua, and our third co-captain Aaron and uh another uh team member really good team member of mine her name is Fina and I have a really good uh younger team member his name is Michael Allen and uh my sister Evelyn Puyama and there's a possibility there's another one added to it but she's still pending but no, are they all Hopi runners, or are they from different tribes? Uh they're all they're all Hopi runners, yeah, and from uh, a different Pueblo tribe too as well, and uh, Hispanic, I believe. Yeah, so awesome. Now, would you say like you're in this day and age, you would say you're like the most known Hopi runner? Uh, no, not, not, not really. I mean, there's some other bona fide or dynamite runners out there, not like from Hopi, like Caroline Sikelka to a Wayne Perry, um, Milford to Anima, who was such a, like a dynamite runner back in the seventies. But, uh, yeah, I still look up to him to this day, but, you know, it's always good to indulge him and say hi. And, you know, just, you know, I'm just really humble about it because, you know, I, I, I like to create that good relationship with them, knowing that if they need help from my end or if they need, I, if I need their help with something. But, you know, I think all in all, like, not only specifically for Hobi, but, you know, just other indigenous tribes out there, knowing that they are some good runners out there. So, 
Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. How do you stay motivated when you don't want to run? Oh, man. Um, that's a good question because um, there's certain times I there's certain times where I just I'm in a funk where I don't be like, oh, man, I got to go another run or secondary run of the day. So, you know, I'll just like be like, OK, let's do the let's do the lifestyle, you know, wake up in the morning, get some coffee, get some some uh, fuel in me and then do my activation. But, you know, sometimes when it comes to to the afternoon runs, afternoon runs are kind of like, man, I'm like second run of the day. I'm like, OK, let's do the whole regimen again, coffee, fuel and then get out the door. But, you know, I, I guess where I want to occupy myself, where I want to motiv motivate myself to keep um, getting out the door and turning that doorknob is like, um, I would like just read a book, one of my favorite books, or watch a really good uh, TV show or a movie, or sometimes I'll go on YouTube and watch like these um, running, uh, running montage, training montage. And I'd be like, oh, okay. I kind of feel the endorphins getting into me now. And I'll be like, all right, I, I'm in the mood and, you know, I'm going to get some good, uh, listen to some good, uh, pick a good playlist when I go running and, you know, just be like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to think about going this other route or anything. But, you know, there's always times like that where um, I have to stay motivated and just keeping accountable with just getting outdoor, getting the miles in, getting the fitness in and then coming back and then post run. But um, all in all, in the end, it kind of feels like, OK, it's good. I stepped out the door because, you know, I'm outside saying hi to the folks in the village or even to the city. But, you know, it's always good that they see me out there running and I see them out, you know, just casually doing their thing. So but I guess people, peers, music, books, reading, um, I guess, content wise that pretty much kind of uplifts me. And also not only that, but, you know, like in Hopi, you know, you have like your uncles say like, don't, don't be lazy. Or, you know, like when they say in Hopi, I'm nane, you know, you always hear that all the time where they want you not to be lazy, but then again, they want you to keep living and taking care of what you have to do. So that all ties into it to staying motivated. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah, man, it looks like you got a good regimen of trying to stay motivated. What are the top three little things that you do to prevent injury? So, you know, uh, I guess the first one is um, drinking plenty of water, having good fuel in me, uh, good fats, good carbs, good, um, you know, good food. Just knowing that it can replenish my muscles, sore muscles, you know, and, you know, I guess eating good, good food will help you uh, recover faster and making sure you're getting all your nutrients in yourself, along with supplement intake, such as me taking, uh, I take a bunch of protein or um, some iron, iron pills just to produce more blood flow or like more blood cells in me in getting oxygen also uh, fish oil because you know i care about my bones and heart so you know it's just all those things that tie in for my body to feel good and then it makes it much more easier for me to have a good night's sleep or uh, have a good run or you know just replenishing the muscles that would be the first one and then the second one would be you know of course like the physicality of it is, you know, after a run, I do get sore. I do get body aches. I'm like, man, I just, that was a good hard workout. And, you know, the volume, the mileage is getting so high that, you know, there's going to be some nicks and ticks there where I'm like, man, my legs are just absolutely just like fried now. So, you know, it's always good to have a good uh, massage just by doing the little things, doing barefoot running just to take care of the tendons the Achilles, your calf muscles, and, you know, taking ice baths, you know, just to, just to give the, the muscles a little shock for more blood flow. And I guess third would be, you know, having a good night's rest, you know, taking some time off, staying off the feet, 
and just like elevating your legs and you know just reading a book or just taking your mind off of the running but then again like like you just don't want to like overwhelm yourself so I guess the mental state I guess it's not quite injury free but you know I just don't want to feel so clouded where like am I gonna get injured or what but like you know it's just having that good that good realm of um getting much needed rest where I'm going to be ready, be ready for the next run. So that will be the last. <laughs> nice. Now, um, how do you do an ice bath? Like tell us a little bit more about your ice bath routine. So the ice bath routine, uh, after a good, like a good high volume track session or even a long run, or possibly like if I have like a, progression run with some 45 second hill strides but you know after once my body is cooled down you know i'm getting my recovery in with food and then uh, i would just pump myself into a bathtub with full of ice uh keeping it keeping it like around 50 degrees or so 50 uh 49 or 48 47 give or take and i would just sit there for about 10 to 15 minutes or possibly 20 minutes, give or take. And yeah, that's about it. And then just, you know, go on with my day. And then, yeah. <laughs> and dang. <clears throat> when you first did an ice bath, like, what was going through your mind? Uh, I, once I got introduced to the ice bath, it was back in college at Muskogee, Oklahoma. Um, they had like a medical uh, exercise room where they had like an ice bath and be like, Oh, you can take ice baths there. I was like, okay, I never tried it before, but why not? Let's give it a go. So, you know, it all started from like dipping my legs in there. And then I was like, Oh, this feels quite good. Sat in there for 10 minutes. And then they'll be like, Oh yeah, you can sit like at the bottom of the tub and you can get your glutes, your hamstrings, your quads, like your lower body. And I was like, okay, so, so I went ahead and dared myself and to do that. And I was like, man, this it's cold. It's uncomfortable. Like you're kind of like hyperventilating and trying to catch your breath. But then again, like it's going to, my body's going to thank me from the, from the freezing temperatures, knowing that like, yo, this is good for yourself. You don't want to overwhelm your legs. You don't want to get some extra blood flow and replenish. But then again, like, you just get used to it and I'm like, yo, I'm thinking that like this is what athletes do. Like they take ice baths. I feel like I'm on like on the old spice uh commercial where like <laughs> one of yeah. the football players are just like sitting in the ice and they're just like chilling and be like, yup, drinking a protein shake and be like, Okay. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it was it was kinda intimidating because it's so cold. I'm well with cold temperatures and I'm like, man. I'm an athlete now. I'm like, okay. So then, then on, I kind of just, um, you know, just caught on to it. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just add this to my recovery methods. And so till this day, I still do ice baths. So, yeah. <laughs> we, would you ever um, do one of those, I forgot what you call it, um, the chirogenic chamber, I think. I forgot what it's called. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, where you stand and then it's kind of like a chamber, but it gets cold and then you just stand there yeah. like it's all smoky and foggy. It comes up. Yeah, I I always wanted to try that. So, but then again, I'm like, oh man, I don't think I can get a hold of that advanced uh, technology of recover. But, you know, it's always the old school way, you know, get a cold water, pour a bag of ice in there and then just sit. But I always wanted to try those uh, little uh recovery chambers and i'm like they seem to do well but i'm like man i want to try those <laughs> yeah i heard they're pretty good too but um they have some down here in phoenix and it's a like it's a lot just to do like one session I'm like god damn this much just for like one hour crazy <laughs> Yeah, man. But uh, whenever I'm down in the valley, I'll give you a shout and be like, yo, show me this recovery chamber. Let me, let me I want to try it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like when you come back, when you come down to Phoenix, and um, I'll definitely um, 
tell you about it, then maybe we can go check it out and try it. <laughs> That'd be cool. That'd be an interesting thing to try, though. I'm down for it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Same here, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, man. But yeah, because I heard like one time you got bit in the in the butt or something like that. Oh yeah, man. So story time. Um, like, you know, I have encountered some dogs where they have like took a good chomp out of me, but it was from my legs. And I don't know, it's so weird. I'm always encountered by a dog before I go to Boston. So like the first Boston marathon, I got attacked by a dog on my leg. And then the second time I went to Boston just recently, I got bit in the butt. And I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm like, yo, this is kind of like a tradition or something or in that I'm going to get mauled and dodge how many dodge death, how many, how many times. But, but this time it was kind of like unique, <laughs> I guess. But, you know, I, I, so I just, I was doing my warm up, my activation in the, in my driveway and I was getting ready to run. And then, you know, I like my own headspace where, like, I'm not so bothered, but there's some good days and some bad days where, like, I'm being a pest. I'm always being pestered by a dog. And then, but this one, like, I did my activation. And then next thing you know, I started my watch. I started my playlist. I'm like, yo, today's going to be a good run. It's an easy run. I'm like, just going to flush out the legs and then just bop around town. And then I literally, like, not even a mile, but, like, probably, like, a 400 meters down down from my house in the neighborhood, like, like, I see these dogs, and then they were barking at me, and I'm like, okay, so I did, I came back, and I completed my run, and then I was just far from, from my house down from the neighborhood, and then I completed it, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm just going to walk, cool off, and then next thing you know, like, I saw the dogs from like the right side of my per peripheral vision. And then I was like, I picked up a rock just in case, because I know they're trying to encroach on me that like, they want to like, like pounce at me. So, you know, I was walking down the street, just minding my business. And then next, you know, they started like charging at me, like three of them. And then I'm like, dang it. And then I try like tossing like rocks towards the way and you know that didn't work and I got like like almost like shoved right like literally up against my my neighbor's uh, house and you know I was kind of like take refuge there because she had like all these items and I'm like man and then next you know like they started surrounding me then I was like trying to like bop and weave and trying to use my hands so they won't get my legs and then one bold dog that one bold dog had the like the guts to take a chomp out of my butt and then it got me like mm. real good on the on the left group and it got me good and I'm like yo I'm like I was just frustrated I was just like man I literally can't have a nice decent run without getting bit by a dog or even just getting pastured by one and then so my neighbor he saw me and then um he saw me and then he was like oh you're all right you okay and I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And I'm, I was just like, just, oh, my blood was just boiling. And I'm like, oh, man. So, and then I was about to, I was not far from my house. And then <laughs> they, these dogs wouldn't stop bothering me. And then all of a sudden they started barking at me. And I was like, dude, can you drive in front of me? And then, so he did. And they started barking again. And they were coming around the car. And like, I just panicked and hopped on the hood of the car and I was like, dude, just take me back to my driveway. And then I got off his ride, the, off the hood of his car. Then there was blood on there. And I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. And then I was like, he was like, where did he get you? I thought I was like, I think I got bit in the butt. And then next thing you know, I just pulled my I just pulled my my half tights down and I showed him and I was like, dude, did he really get me? And he was like, Yeah, he got you pretty good. And I was like, dang it. And then so I had a sore booties maximus for like the past five days within that week and yeah so it was kind of unique it was kind of hilarious um it's a story for me to tell people enjoy it people laugh about it but hey man res dogs mm -hmm. if you're a runner a full-time runner re reservation just be prepared or just be aware that 
you know, those dogs are just absolutely just not so friendly, but some are friendly, but you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. So just be careful out there when you do some activity out there. <laughs> Yeah. You ever thought about like carrying like an airsoft pistol with you, like maybe like a hand pellet gun or something like that? Or maybe something No, like that. I've been told I have been told so many times before by my folks and um yeah, I just I the only thing that I carry on me is my phone and that's it. I mean running with the airsoft pistol or even a slingshot or like a taser a handheld taser or like a pocket switch knife, you know, by, by pushing the button and it just pokes out. But, you know, I never had that in mind because, you know, to me, like these neighborhood dogs, like I just don't want to harm them, you know, because I'm sure like they're so close to their family members. But then again, I'm like, make, you know, that I run in a neighborhood and it would be cool that you would consider it of, you know, that I train every day running up and down through the neighborhood at least you know just be 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 a good neighbor do your part where like okay Kyle's training in the neighborhood maybe we should uh you know tie our dogs up or you know separate him from the dogs so he can have like a good pe peaceful training session and I kind of put that in the back of my mind but then again like no there's no action you know I got bit in the butt so I'm like well I think it's time to invest in one so my neighbor gave me a slingshot so uh it's oh, yeah. pretty nifty. <laughs> Sweet. How about mace? You ever like want to carry a mace or something? Um, yeah, I've been I've been told to carry mace too as well. I mean, I never tried mace. I'd rather read the instructions before like making a rookie move and like, you know, try like, oh a dog's coming <laughs> towards me and I'm trying to spray the mace. And I look at the nozzle and I spray the mace inside my eye, like yeah, <laughs> but you know, there's there's all kinds of instruments and tools to you know fight off those like those res dogs. But then again, like you know, just protecting myself and protecting others. But yeah, man. Yeah, dude, res dogs are vicious, man. Cause um, I heard that there was this um PSA that went out on Facebook about some dogs in Hot Bella that um that attacked the lady or somebody, something like that. Yeah, I saw that. I, I I believe it was a little girl, like where the the dog bites were so like severe, like it was almost like life taking taking, but yeah, but you know, it's a huge issue, like not only for the Hopi reservation, but especially like in Navajo country or any other all all around with Indian country basically, but you know, I, I kind of felt the way, like, man, you know, people want to get active. People want to go out. People want to, like, go go for a walk in their neighborhood and say hi to the folks. But then again, they're so frightful knowing that, like, you know, there's some household that has, like, these, just, just these, like, just ugly dogs that just want to, like, you know, take a chomp out of somebody. But I'm like, yeah, it goes both ways where I'm training. But then again, there's kids who want to, like, go play outside with their friends and you know like like all in all people want to do some activities and just like have a good day out you know like being outdoors but you know it, it's just one of those things where we're all bothered by it and you know I'm not the only one but some people are and you know it, it was very sad I just wish the little girl or who whoever got really like just almost mauled by those dogs you know i wish them well and you know i think it's just in in a wake where the tribe has to do something to take care of their people and knowing that it can have people to feel so safe to go do activities you know it kind of prolongs into common sense but then again actions speak louder than words instead of like oh yeah let's uh this happened so let's put a press out i'm like dude this happened like so many years ago like come on now like dude <laughs> Yeah, man, it's sad because I, I was like, damn, this actually happened. Like, fuck, man. Like, there is a lot of <laughs> like res dogs just out and about, and it's like, what the fuck, like, somebody needs to do something about these dogs. So 
you know, I mean, I do, I am a dog owner. I do have dogs, but you know, I just do my part where, you know, like, okay. Um, you know, I, I want people to walk safe in my neighborhood. So I'd rather do my part and, you know, chain on my dogs. So, yeah. <laughs> How was your, your marathon run when you, the recent one you just did? Uh, it was good. You know, all in all, it was good to be back in Boston. But this time, the first time in Boston, it was great. It was unbelievable. It was so much good memories. But the second time in Boston, um, you know, you just, in a, in a runner's life, like, there's going to be some highs and lows. There's going to be some some things that are not so aligned, meaning that the whole component is the mentality, the spiritual, the emotional, and the physical you know, those components must align align together. But, you know, Boston was great. But then again, running 26.2 miles, there's going to be some barriers. There's going to be some hurdles that you have to overcome and test where that based on being fit, being in shape, where you want to make the bar so high and knowing that you want to become, you want to, you want to do a much more better result from the beginning. And, you know, I ran the first Boston Marathon, I ran the 2.26.17, but this time I ran the 2.38, um, 2.39, uh, 17, 20s, something around there. But this Boston, this year's Boston Marathon didn't really quite go as I thought it would, as I planned it would. But, you know, it, it was heartbreaking for me because, you know, I was like, man, I'm a 2.26.17 marathoner. What can I unfold next? Can I run a 2.20, a 2.18 to qualify for the Olympic time trials? You know, I tried to reach that goal, but like I said, a race is long. There's something or something will you have to defeat and face head on and endure. But, you know, I, I was unhappy. I was unsatisfied. But, you know, taking it to that another round where – you want to take it to another level, you have to fight some battles where like you have to endure, like just being Hopi, you know, there's some things that may or may not go your way. And it's the same thing as a marathon where it's a long ways, but you can always overcome and face the obstacles and just bounce back much more wiser with better reasoning. But some point in my life, in my running life, you're going to always have to face those challenges and overcome and then continue to move forward. So, you know, it's very unfiltered. It's so raw coming from me because, you know, I think the sport without having highs and lows, you know, you don't really show your true colors or knowing that you are just human like everyone else, you know. But in the sport itself, I respect it. You know, I love it. It makes me who I am till today, and I wouldn't be talking to you on this podcast knowing that, yep, this year's uh, second year uh, Boston Marathon didn't go quite as well. But now that with better reasoning and looking forward, we're going to go ahead and shoot for that standard for the Olympic uh, qualifying time time trial race, which will be in uh, – in the Hawaii marathon. So you just got to keep trying, got to keep your nose to the grindstone. You just got to roll with the punches. And, you know, like, I mean, if Muhammad Ali wouldn't be the best boxer ever, or, you know, Michael Jordan wouldn't be the best basketball uh, player ever, or Tony Hawk, you know, wouldn't be the best skateboarder ever, or yourself not being the best skateboarder ever and trying to get to that most grand stage of all knowing that you just work your butt off and you just keep going so yeah but all in all boston was great it was good to be back to the east coast but we will always return and we'll always you know become back become come back better than ever and all in all you just gotta endure and just don't give up so i think that's the best advice for me to deliver that that it it difficult times will happen so but you always gotta just keep turning that doorknob and just just hustle and just work
where it does pay off and especially like in a marathon like those things are like pretty far runs i mean i don't really know much about them but i know like they do expand like miles and miles you know i kind of like treat the marathon as in like life you know evolving from when i was a little boy and like competing in like school races competing in the community races competing in the hobby traditional races you know i kind of reflect back on that like when I was such a young boy, but now like I'm 25 years old and I'm here racing on the grand, on the grand stage on the East coast, representing my people, representing the indigenous uh, country. And I'm like, man, am I supposed to be here? Or like, is this dream so vivid that I am just breathing the air that these people are here just to run on the grand stage. And I'm like, man, I'm like, you know, I'm just a Hopi kid from the Hopi reservation, but, you know, I am here for a purpose to endure and to make my people proud. So, yeah. What's your favorite part about running a marathon? Is it the traveling and getting to new, meet new people? Um, You know, I think um, the preparation in the beginning, it's so nice. I like it. And, you know, but um, hanging out with, the team, Tim, team led. It's always good to see them, and you know, I always think about my parents, you know, in the community, and you know, I just feel like I think every athlete's life has to go through that lifestyle where they're getting ready for something that they have prepared for, and you know, they have to keep their loved ones in mind, their main supporters, and the travel, th- travel wise, it's always good to indulge yourself with the new culture, what the people eat, what the people do, what's their favorite place to go to. And when I went to Boston, um, I was asking my good buddy, Dwayne, like, hey, man, like, what's the best local coffee shops here? Because, like, I'm always interested about the vintage coffee shops. I'm a huge coffee fanatic. My whole life depend- depends on it. <laughs> but, you know, I just want to indulge with with what what's the good coffee here i mean dunkin donuts out in boston it's all right but then again i'm like what's what's the favorite place that people like to eat what's the authentic food that they like to eat or what's their favorite uh you know just the locals just trying to fit in fitting in with the locals the travel part yeah it's always good and you know if you have if you know any like close um will be competing in the same place it's always good to create wonderful memories and create new friends and create new relationships and expand it expand it expand it into a good community all around so yeah sweet what is your um food intake or diet when you're running so um in the beginning like you know i was trying to figure out like what works best for me and then i kind of found find my my groove my my food intake swagger or style where like um i love coffee i love to drink coffee before I run and uh drink some water and drink have like a few um a bagels peanut butter with bananas you know just some good carbs that will make me last throughout the session and i don't just don't i won't grow tired or where my body's like out of funk and you know, breakfast, I have the same thing every day, mostly. But if it's like a longer session or a bigger session, I'll have like like scrambled eggs or some whole wheat toast or oatmeal or some fruit. Or sometimes, I ain't going to lie, I would like to have like a good old Pop-Tart. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, and then lunch would be like a good tasty sandwich with avocado. I'm a huge avocado fanatic um you know some good protein turkey ham and for dinner wise you know it's all about the good greens the good fats the good carbs such as pasta rice beans or you know the hopi traditional food that we that we grow on hopi like beans squash corn um you know just the good authentic hopi cuisines that my mom still makes to this day because she's so simple and it's so go-to 
and you know i literally don't have to go to like a freaking sprouts or like a whole foods market just to get these ingredients because it's always good to have that cultivation where you grow your own food and i just want to set this set the record straight i heard somewhere that you were um vegan is that true or not I used I used to be vegan back when I started getting into running more more seriously, but that was like back in my graduate promoting from sixth grade going into junior high, and then you know that didn't really sit well to me because I was still getting more fatigue. I was still trying to find that that groove where my body is so alert, I feel good. And it didn't really pan out to me, so I think I needed more to do, needed to do more research of what, how, what works for me the best. So you know, I just kind of cut that out, and then I was like, okay, well, I gotta find another scenario because, you know, living on the reservation, man, you know, there's it's hard to get some whole foods in you. Because you're always relying to like, man, I want to go to a freaking convenience store, go get a chimichanga or a freaking bean and cheese burrito, you know? And it's it's kind of hard, almost like a food desert out here. But then again, you know, I always relied on growing my own food. But yeah, that was pretty much previous, like, yeah, previous years when I started to get myself much more serious about running. But yeah. I'm plant-based and I'm vegan. I've been, it's been going on about almost four years now. And you're right about the reservation, how, because it's hard to live that lifestyle out there because there's so much like fast food restaurants and nothing but junk food. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, not just out on the reservation, but it's like that here in the city as well. But I would say it would be a lot more harder out there to live that lifestyle. That was that was that, and but then again, I kind of changed my whole ways and aspects how to approach with good dieting, and it's good to have a good a good meal in you, and especially for you, you're a full time skateboarder, so you're always fighting with your legs, with the board, with the asphalt, and you know I'm I know that there was another professional skateboarder from Thrasher, uh, what was his name? He kind of changed his whole lifestyle to you. The Neen Williams. Yes, yeah, him. I saw his vice his vice episode and I'm like, whoa, dude. Like he was just talking about like when he would like like land a trick and he'd be like, All right, I land this trick. Let's go party. Let's go do all this jazz. And then for breakfast he said he'll like have like freaking hot fries and a bean and cheese burrito and trying to nail that trick. I'm like, man, dude, I'm like he actually changed his ways and he became much more of a fitter and a much more better skateboarder. I mean, like those methods, they actually work and like, they just gotta, what works best for you. And I was just absolutely blown away about it, but I just wanted to let you know that um, I love skateboarding and that's what kind of really inspired me. And I'm sure it did to, to you too. Yeah, dude. Um, It's crazy because like you were saying, like, how a lot of skateboarders would just like party, drink, smoke, and do all this stuff. And that was like back in the day. But now that with this whole fitness lifestyle and everything, like a lot of skateboarders that I know of, like are getting their health in check and they're doing all this like fitness stuff and eating right. And they quit drinking, they quit smoking. Like Neen Williams, he's one of them. And there's like a lot more other skateboarders out there that are following in Neen Williams' um, footsteps. And it's pretty cool to see um, skateboarders um, going that route. And that's what kind of motivated me to like the plant-based lifestyle type deal, I guess you could say. I mean, that was one of the inspirations that I got from them. And they say that if you want good results, it's always good to do the little things and making sure that your body and heart and like everything has to be aligned just to have a good result of, and it'll make you skateboard longer or it'll make me run, run, run as much as I can until like when I grow old. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah, dude. 
That's cool, man. <clears throat> How have you seen yourself as an athlete evolve over the years? Uh, you know, in the in the beginning of years, you know, I was just a young little dude and, you know, I didn't really know too much of, of the outside world or what I was getting myself into and creating that lifestyle of, you know, it was kind of like a learning, a learning, a learning, uh, I guess, puzzle for me to put my whole running, running picture together and let it mold itself as I grew older. But, you know, um, uh, I was a little bit of a hefty kid back then because I love to eat, you know, I love to eat those junk food. And then, you know, I tried to um, suit myself like, man, I, I'm going to be, I want to see myself as a runner, but, you know, I want to find something else that I can do outside of running that I can rely on where it's not too much running. So, you know, after that, it kind of evolved into myself, like getting into coffee and um, I started getting into music and I started getting into reading books and I started getting into like doing stuff, crafting with my hands, you know, making Hopi, Hopi arts and crafts. And then, you know, and then after that, it kind of grew much more where like I like to do, do uh, paint canvases or uh, go watch a movie or go to concerts. And, you know, it, it couldn't be all about strictly about running, but, you know, I just really wanted to evolve and keep my mind, uh, keep, keep an open mind where like, I don't want to like pester myself with too much running, but, you know, physicality wise, I kind of evolve where I'm getting much more older and then things are starting to change where my, my fitness wise, masculinity, masculinity wise, and, you know, it changed, the body is changing where like, whoa, I'm running these fast. I never hit this pace. I never ran this long of a mileage before. Like, it's all about growing accustomed to, you know, the physicality wise, mental, mental, mental wise, spiritual wise, and emotional wise. So, you know, you just got to find that, that groove and, you know, your swagger where like, okay, this works for me. I feel good. I evolved. I tried this thing. I tried that. And I tried this method and, you know, but yeah. <laughs> Sweet. If you weren't a runner, like what would you be doing as a profession or like anything besides running? What would it, what would you be doing? Oh man, uh, I probably would be uh, pursuing in business management by, you know, you know, selling coffee because you know I think that's it was just my true calling and you know that's what I wanted to pursue in and create that economic development out here on Hopi. You know, make some good spots, make some positions available for like if you like coffee like hey let's, let's sell some coffee or sell some big goods you know like make a really good cafe here in Monkopi like where our Hopi people would be like yo man let's go grab some coffee so you know I always wanted to pursue in the coffee business so that was kind of my end and also like you know owning a owning myself a own record store because I kind of turned myself towards music uh, you know, I was just a huge music fanatic back when I was in high school. And yeah, possibly make a cafe that will sell Hopi, Hopi art and crafts and merch, you know, like just one of that realm. <laughs> but yeah. Sweet. I think that's something that could possibly be done. I mean, I'm pretty sure you could go after it. I would love to see something like that out in and Hopi, uh, Hopi Cafe with, like you said, artwork and all that good stuff in there. Maybe later in the future, like, if I'm, like, my run days are, like, just about over with competitiveness and all that jazz, I'll probably go ahead and just pursue that for the rest of my life. <laughs> Selling coffee and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be able to do that, like, right? Like, not, I mean, not right now, but like maybe later on down the road, even though you're still running, like you can still pursue it. Uh, yeah, I would. I could do both if that's possible, but 
it um, of course it's possible but then again like i gotta find me a good crew find me like who can work each part at a desk knowing that like the whole realm of the business itself will just go right into into the pocket where i'm not being like overly stressed because i think business management can be over <laughs> overly stressful because you know like got to make some calls you got to get some deets you got to do all the jazz inventory like man dude like <laughs> yeah there's a lot um running a business and that's have like overhead and expenses and all that stuff and a good team but it is a lot you know we'll we'll see what the um, the future unfolds from there so yeah <laughs> yeah i'm sure you can do it so what's the next next stage of life as an athlete for you? What do you got going on? Um, for me, athlete-wise, um, hopefully, you know, of course, the running team is, like, almost the first stage. But what's next is to be done that it would be great to have, like, a platform or, uh, you know, like a daily uh, activity day where i can just like you know hang out with the with the youth like you know just invite them over to a facility and be like hey um if you're interested of uh running or any other physical activity i can help you uh get you on a board with living a healthy lifestyle and creating that good um as i as i say good medicine for yourself and you can share it with possibly your elders and you know I think that realm is having not to have the youth go into facing heart difficulties or health health difficulties or, you know, becoming diabetic or, you know, all that jazz because, you know, daily we do, we do see that every day, but that, and then, um, you know, I guess invest in a park where on Hopi where like, where folks can get active and just run in a safe environment and not being pestered by dogs. You know what I mean? I mean, have like a good track or have like a good field, like a turf field, you know, I mean, there's so much that that can happen and be structured with getting the people out, getting the people out in a safe atmosphere where they can run laps on the track or they can do some exercises on these stationary, like, exercise machines like i see in california or you know like i mean it would be so cool to have those out here on hopi and just having them live in a safe live in a safe environment and they can keep up with their health you know yeah dude that'd be awesome and i'm pretty sure like i have faith in you and i believe that you can do all these things that you want to do and helping out the hopi community and just getting the lifestyle back in check and just living your dream of running and having these um facilities open to to people to get their health back on track. Yeah, so and um I just heard the word that uh well I saw content where like I believe first Mesa created their first half pipe or quarter pipe. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if you heard about that, but I thought that was a really big movement, like investing into something like that for kids to like skateboard at a, at a safe environment instead of like, you know, <laughs> being chased off by by business managers at a like at a store or a convenience store because I know kids want to skate and I'm sure like they want to have like a really good facility where to skate at. So that kind of like really opened my mind, opened my eyes with the whole skateboarding realm and I thought that was just really awesome and like I kind of thought about you I'm like man I'm sure he has the same mindset where he wants to have a really legit like skateboard part here on Hopi where you can host some like some skateboarding demo skateboarding just you know all all that good stuff just to spread awareness and possibly have like a local competition and and invite uh, others from other reservations and i think that would be really cool to have on hopi too and you know i mean your platform with skateboarding will definitely 
amplify for something like that and that can just go a long way with you creating a community all about skateboard with me creating a community all about like fitness being active health and wellness prologging promoting you know but that's 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 something that i wanted to like praise and uh you know just to deliver to you and we all have that same purpose too so i just wanted to tell you that buddy yeah dude i heard about that um skate ramp or the half part that they built out there and it was all done with um i forgot the name of the skate 264 i believe that's what it was called they yeah, were doing all these four. yeah fundraisers and raffles to get that um half pipe built which was pretty awesome and i saw pictures of it it was pretty cool and right now like i am in talks with um some people that are willing to help out expand that skate park a little bit more to make it more like bigger and um add more more things to it so We'll see how that goes. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it will definitely, like, because to me, like, living out in Hopi, you know, kids can be bored and they want to do something and fulfill, like, their aspirations. And, you know, it kind of, like, it kind of navigates them to where they want to do drugs, they want to do arson, they want to do, like, these these bad medicine where like they don't get to live that longer where they have these bad substance inside their bodies. And like, you know, like to this day, you know, this generation is like, man, what about the young ones? What about the young boys and girls? They have so much to live and knowing that they have their own story to tell. It could be skateboarding, it could be running. It could be like any other sport knowing that it can inspire and make their people proud too. And, you know, just making that healthy community out here. And that's what we're all about. You know, that's what Hopi is all about. You know, um, I guess there's a Hopi word for it and I completely forgot about it, but, you know, just, you know, having that good perseverance and preserving our, our way of life and our healthy living. So, I think that's the main focus of why we want to turn towards these young ones to live a long life, to live a better life. And possibly they're going to more than likely, they're going to be the next big thing, the next big role model, like and to inspire the next generation. So yeah, man. You're an influence to younger generation. Like do you get um little kids coming up to you and like, them asking like you inspired me to start running and doing all that stuff oh yeah totally i mean it's it's super sweet it's very humbling you know i mean it feels good and it's just the simple things when they say like oh hi kyle or good morning kyle or like have a good day kyle i'll be like i'll be like hey buddy how's it going how are you doing are you still running or what's what's going on what are you what do you what do you have next or when's your next big race or like you know just saying like okay well we'll see you later all right and then we'll be like just take care of yourself i want to see you soon again you know just those certain simple things of greeting them and yeah man it's just one of those things man and you know who knows man i mean you may not see them again that's kind of like the downside of it but you know it's always good to reconnect with them and just say the simplest things like good morning hey man um i'm proud of you i love you like you're doing so much great i'm gonna be here for you because you know there's some times where who are they gonna rely on man like who are they gonna go to so you know i really don't want to make those kids sad or down you know because they beam upon others who are role models in the community and i'm sure they beam beam upon you like you know like man this guy skates man i want to skateboard Maybe he has a skate deck for me. Maybe he can give me some cool stickers to put on my helmet. Or I don't have a helmet. Maybe I can ask him, saying like, hey, I don't have a helmet. Or like a kid would be like, hey, I don't have these 
really good fast shoes, I'd be like, tell you what, if you keep this up, I will do you solid and buy you like a really good pair of Nike shoes or I'll buy you a really good set of wheels for your skateboard or, you know, just, just those little things knowing that they want to become better and they want to be like you, but they have their own story to craft and create. Yeah, dude, exactly. Cause that's how I feel. Like when I see like sk- little skateboarders coming up to me and they ask me like, how long you've been skateboarding? And I'll tell them. And then like, if I see the passion and drive in them, I'll have boards on hand and I'll be like, here, check this out. And I'll just give them a board, a brand new fresh board, and they'll be all stoked. And I go, all I tell them is like, you got to promise me one thing is that you'll never stop skateboarding. That's the only thing I ask about you. And then they'll be like, yeah, I promise. And then to this day, I know some of them are still skating. I give away like my complete boards too. The ones that I personally own, the ones that I ride, like if I see a kid at a skate park and he has like a busted up board or something, I'm like, and I see the drive and passion that he has for skateboarding, I'll just be like, hey man, there's a, there's a brand new board that I just set up. This is mine. And like, I'll just give it to them. And that's all I tell them. I just like, promise me you won't stop skating. And they get all stoked and hyped about it seeing your your hero seeing that role model spectrum and you know it's it, it's good it, it makes your heart happy knowing that they want to continue and pursue their their sport or craft or anything like that it, i mean for me it doesn't have to be running it could be like something else like music or coffee or hopi arts and crafts because they want to pursue more and they want to get better at it and you know it kind of takes me back where um, I looked at some WWF uh, wrestlers. I always wanted to be the Ultimate Warrior. <laughs> I always wanted to be like, I always wanted to be like Rey Mysterio, you know. And like, you know, back back those back in those days where I always wanted to be like Bret Hart or Jeff Hardy, you know. Just looking up to those certain. I I was in that same pocket, man. I was in that same pocket where I wanted to be like those guys, you know. Yeah, you still watch wrestling. Oh yeah, I'm all about wrestling, man. Uh, I've been <laughs> I grew up upon wrestling back when it was WWF, ACW, uh, ECW, um, when I was NWO or the Wolfpack. You know, oh man, it still gives me that good feeling and that just that drive. You know, like what it took them so long just to be that great, just to get to where they're at and where where how how their whole i guess their ultimate drive came from and yeah i, I love it yeah because i remember um we were talking about something on i think the new um promotion of aew i remember like i, I forgot what we were talking about but we were talking about the new company that came out aew yeah, AEW. Yeah, so um, like I said, I was so stoked to see uh, CM Punk that he committed to AEW, and then I was like, "Yo, this is so far out" because like I was such a huge fan of him, and then um, so I had to get myself some merch and whatnot. But uh, yeah, man, it was good. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. We were talking about CM Punk. No, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah I, I, I still. I know, I know Sita Justin's all about wrestling too. Oh yeah, totally. But anyways, yeah, dude. Um, you have any last parting words or advice for the younger generation? Of, like encouraging words. Um, you know, I guess for the youngs. For the young ones, you know, out there, you know, you have your own story to tell and it's up to you to craft craft it and make it into something that is so uplifting that will give you a purpose, knowing that it makes your people proud and just don't forget about your roots because mine my story all started from from Hopi and it started from a household 
from my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters. And, you know, it all starts from home and it's the humbling effect where the journey is going to take you somewhere much more bigger and everyone has a journey, but, you know, it's all about keeping your spirit, keeping your heart and keeping your voice and your mental state aligned and well-maintained and just showing that grand respect for every every single individual individual who has a story so it's always good to share share your stories or share your highs and lows because you're not alone who 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 are folks out there who are trying to go for that same goal in mind and be something great so it's your story it's your story to tell it's your heart to tell and it's your mind and body and spirit knowing that you want to inspire and motivate and make people proud and you know it can do much more where you're going to go and you're going to live a long life and just reflect back on the on the memories where man i had this tough time man this time was good man i met this freaking person who was just absolutely awesome where we had the same similarities you know but the journey will arise and just keep keep going and and don't give up because you know we will feel empty if we just throw the towel in and just walk away from it but then again you have a purpose to continue and to push forward awesome man well i appreciate you coming on to the podcast and talking about your story and about running and how you got involved in running and I wish you the best of luck on your next running endeavors, the next marathon, and to stay safe out there and try to carry a stick next time when you run the rest dogs away. <laughs> thank you very much for thank you so much for having me. I appreciate your time and uh yeah, so my friends, uh check out the not what's Sanvini uh skateboarding company. They're really good, they're really well, they will take care of you with all your needs with skateboarding so have a good one stay safe i love you guys take care take care of one another have a good one and the next one is just for us thank you i appreciate you coming on Kyle, so much Kuku, for coming on to the podcast continue on your running journey stay strong run with a good heart strong mind and the passion behind what you do. So remember, the saddest part about life is wasted talent. Don't ever waste your talent. Go out and use it. Show it to the world. Have fun with it. You have that talent for a reason. Don't waste it. So whatever your passion is, keep doing it. Don't waste time chasing after success or comparing yourself to others. Because a lot of people do that. They compare themselves to other individuals and they start doubting themselves because they're not as good as that person or they're not the best at whatever that is that they're doing and they just get so doubtful and it messes with their head. So don't ever compare yourself to anybody. You're your own person. And also remember that... um. Life is a series of punches, hardship. So enjoy your life and the success will come and you'll have a lot of stories to tell. So with that being said, Koko for listening to this episode. I'll see you guys on the next one. Later. So that's all I got for you today on this episode. Please do me a favor and share the podcast. And if you want to support Nakwats Penny Skateboarding and the podcast, don't forget to head over to our YouTube channel, click that subscribe button, like the videos, and comment. Those quick and easy things really do help us to reach more people. Also, don't forget to visit us on our website at squareup.com slash Skateboarding for the latest Nakwats Penny apparel, such as shirts, skateboards, hoodies, hats, grip tape, stickers, and more. Until next time, y'all have a good one. Fuck off for listening.